records. And what we decided to do was to map all the clinical trials in the country, uh, which is what we did. And in mapping those clinical trials, what we quickly saw is that they're not networked. The, the trial locations are not networked. Uh, the, the investigators have to be uh, ad hoc created and, and recruited. Um, uh, every time there's a trial, patients have to be recruited. Absolutely uh, expensive. So in building this clinical trials atlas, which is actually online right now, what we also realize is that we need to begin to network all of these clinical trial sites around the country and build a national clinical trial network. Um, just think about it, it's, um, it's basically an internet network that queries databases around the country and pulls back to you all of the patients uh, who you might be looking for that fit your protocol. Uh, it should reduce costs, help create the diversity that we need in clinical trials, speed up innovation, and it really doesn't cost a lot of money. And so what we're looking to do is a public-private partnership uh, to, to drive that. We can talk about that. The other thing I would call it your attention to um, that uh, everybody knows but nobody's doing anything about, the demographics in the United States are changing. By 2020, 40% of the U.S. population will be African American, Hispanic, Native American, and Asian. Right now, 78% of all pharmaceuticals consumed in America are consumed by whites. So if you go to a place like California and Texas, what you're seeing is your market share is declining because minority populations consume health care differently. If you just take diabetes, for example, in the state of Texas, by 2020, 64% of, of all the diabetics in Texas will be Hispanic. That's the number. So if you're not shaping your market up for the 21st century, for this diverse population that's coming, uh, then you're going to lose market share. And that's another reason why this clinical trial atlas is important. Thirdly, listening to the panel um, this morning, one of, the, one of the real critical issues here is free enterprise in the American healthcare system. It is over-regulated. We are getting to the point of absolute insanity. And you've got a lot of friends out there, particularly in the patient community and the minority community, who want to step up. If you go and actually talk to them and work with them, you'll see that they feel it. African Americans and Hispanics are not unaware that CER has nothing to do with them because there isn't any patient evidence to promote CER. I mean, we understand that, but guess what? No one is listening. If you went to the IOM uh, meeting on, on CER, every minority organization got up and said, it's a bad idea. Everyone, National Medical, Hispanic Medical, Inter-American College of Physicians, everybody said it, completely ignored it. My final one before the hook, um, and I'm just going to leave this out there because I think this is the big question of the 21st century. We need to start moving towards it, but it is a huge question of the 21st century. I'm going to put it out there as human sustainability. In the same way that physicists are looking for the grand theory, what we're really looking for is human sustainability. It is in the science. The message is absolutely there. Uh, and when you start to think about how to achieve that, the conversation changes. That patient-centered focus that you were talking about, that, that conflict between industry and patients and government, go away in that conversation. Because to achieve that, if you start to put a pencil to paper, you'll see that it, it drives its own agenda, and I think it's really the profound question of the 21st century. Is that 10 minutes? Perfect, Gary. Thank you. <laughs> Jamie? I'm uh, starting my timeout monitor for my child, giving myself 10 minutes. I, get, I have to be in timeout for 10 minutes, according to Alden's rules. Um, so I... Uh, I loved Greg's question, you know, not changing the patent rules for a minute here. And I, I want to, I, I have this sort of sense, I want to bring us up a level for one second here. So who here is a fan of the Matrix, sci-fi fan? I'm a, I'm a sci-fi fan. Okay. So, so are those prophets that you're breathing? You guys remember the scene when, uh, when, when Neo's being taught karate and, uh, and, and, and he's realizing that the world is not real? So is what the pharmaceutical is, industry real? Is it really real? And I'm going to ask a question. Um, and Greg didn't know the answer, so he's in trouble already. How much does Pfizer, how much does Lyrica cost a year? Anyone? 
uh, medium dose white male living in Newton, Mass, on partners PPO out of the direct cost. Give me a rough number. Guess. Come on, somebody. You guys work at Pfizer, right? <laughs> Fifteen hundred bucks a year for the insurance company. Okay, um, that's an important distinction, though, because are those profits real, right? So, um, would you pay fifteen hundred dollars of your own money for that drug, or would you pay out of your own pocket? Because that may be an oncoming reality that I want to talk about. And what, what I'm getting at is a second. There are some transitions, and you asked us for three things: three problems. Let's go with seven minutes. Three problems. Three solutions. So here are my three problems. The monopoly is dead. What do I mean by that? The drug industry is an information monopoly. You have been the only provider of data about your products for 40 years. Nobody else challenges you. Nobody else touches you. You're the only ones running trials of any meaning. And the information monopoly is dead. People are going to come at you with data left, right, and center. It's going to be from different models. It's going to be from comparative effectiveness studies. It's going to be from people like my company that are running things on the side. Um, but there's data coming that's going to change your monopoly, and you don't even have the capacity right now to have conversations about other people's data, let alone begin to acknowledge what it means. Mm -hmm. Problem number two, the rise of the molecular age, the personal molecular age. Now, I know we have been using tools like DNA and RNA and the beginnings of protein chips or proteomics in our labs to understand better and better biology, but it has not touched medicine yet. And that age is changing right now. I lived and grew up through the personal computer revolution. I owned every personal computer from the very first one all the way through. And the 25 years it took us to go from, you know, all, aren't those games cute, a little Apple II, to VisiCalc, to the internet, to the fact that the entire Library of Congress and my phone is timing my son's timeout now. These things took 25 years. It's going to take 10 years to do this in the molecular age. Things are moving faster. And that's going to change medicine in ways that makes all of your prior monopoly data different and different and meaningful. And Medco's wafer and study is the tip of the iceberg, and people are going to come at you with that data. And the last part is transparency. Pfizer is not transparent. Prices are not transparent. Medicine is not transparent. No one knows what anything costs. No one knows whether anything works. No one knows what the side effects are. It's not anyone's fault. It's a combination of regulators and deliberate obfuscation for profits from the doctor's side and the everyone's side. Everyone's acting as rational actors. But it's not transparent, and that's about to end. So you have to ask yourself some questions. If everyone could know everything about every decision made in our company, would that be a good thing? And if it's not, you should think about how to change that. So let's go to the three solutions. Option number one. You know what? This change stuff's too hard. Let's button down the hatches. We'll fire 20% of our workforce a year. We'll ride the profits down, and we'll maximize shareholder value. <laughs> totally legitimate option. In fact, some in the industry would argue that's what you're doing. I actually think this should be really on the table because you know there is it is a course of action that is rational. Companies have made this course of action choice in the past. AT&T wrote out the long distance business, shut it down and went bankrupt, but they did exactly what their investors needed. They decided not to play, they wrote down the profits. That might be a good strategic choice. And the reason it's important to consider is because if you're choosing an alternative, you got to beat that model. And you can't just do it for moral reasons. You've got to do it because you're actually going to beat that model. And I think some drug companies are going to decide to write it down. And it's a legitimate choice. Number two, start an information war. And I mean war. So right now, we're fighting in the United States about the $80 billion extra we spend on all drugs versus all other parts of the world and worthwhile or not worthwhile components. And you know what? Maybe we fund the world's drug discovery or not, and we're going to go through this battle back and forth. But I think it's a pretty short-sighted way of thinking about the problem. When I lay out the healthcare industry, I end up with about a trillion dollars on this left-hand side of this column, which is all the things we do to help anyone. All the procedures, all the surgeries, all the drugs, all the lifestyle, not the lifestyle phase, everything. It's about a, about a trillion dollars. And then on the right-hand side, I have all the things that can go wrong with you. And in the middle 
is this massive information business. It consists of doctors that, you know, force you to come back to their office to get a pap smear by making you write a prescription that everyone knows you should get. Or, you know, Philips, which sells more MRIs and CAT scans that probably are causing greater human health problems than they are helping through inappropriate surgeries and, 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 and inappropriate care. And that, that means there's 1.4 trillion in the middle. That's not a, 1.4 trillion dollars worth of information processing that no one is investing in, no one is thinking about, no one is optimizing, you know, and we had a discussion before about whether this change in the healthcare law is gonna fix this. I don't see it. I see an open business waiting for someone to come in and prove that things work or don't work and deliver the right solution, you know, the one trillion, to the pathology to improve human health. And if you're worried about the 80 billion and Pfizer's, you know, X share of that 80 billion of extra cost and we're fighting it out with the Obama administration and negotiating and all that stuff, you know, that seems like pretty small change against that middle part. Option three. When I say, actually, let me finish that. When I say start an information war, there's a lot of losers in there. There's $480 billion in excess hospital capitalization spending, doctor salaries. $480 billion. So if you want to help people and you want to build something compatible with value, you want to make that patient, that pathology happy, go after that $480 billion and make it worthwhile. Um, last on option three, I think you need to become a healthcare company. Right now, Pfizer is a drug dealer. I don't mean that in a negative, hugely negative context way, but what do you do? You make drugs and you sell them. You sell them to people that presume to be in the healthcare business. Well, we know how badly the healthcare business is working in the United States, and if you want to become a healthcare company, it's about integrating and actually solving the problem around the drug, everything. And I will assert a few things that you should know if you are a healthcare company. You should know how every patient who takes any one of your treatments is doing for the entire duration of the treatment. You should know the difference that you made in that patient's life relative to every single one of your competitors. You should be able to compare the value you generate against everyone else in the real world on everyone, whether they be black <laughs> or white or Hispanic or overweight or underweight or male or female in real time, whether they have 17 comorbidities or none. And the advantage you get out of that is that you have become something that is capable of rapid innovation. Instead of 10 years from testing and learning something to it being meaningful and changing your market, you get to the point where you are now at real time. Did we give advice to that individual on our product and the rest of the product in a truthful way that actionably made a difference in their life? That real time takes your clinical department that thinks in almost decades and moves them to weeks. That's the source of the innovation of, of the software industry. It's the source of the innovation of every industry that is transformed in timeline. So if you're going to do that, you have to become a healthcare company. And if you become a healthcare company, you will know what works in healthcare. And you can use that in your information war to capture a fair and decent share of that $2.4 trillion. Because to my mind, and I used to make drugs, it's a very hard thing to do. And I have a lot of empathy with people who make drugs. You actually generate more good in the healthcare system on average. You can all point out the failures and the stuff that doesn't work. You generate more good in the healthcare system than anyone else. And you should stop feeling so bad about yourself and apologetic or bad about you know, the whining and all that stuff and say, hey, we save people's lives. We go out and prove it and no one else in healthcare does and win that war. But you're not going to do it without the data. Thank you. Okay, now we're in the second part of the game, and that is for you all to challenge, question, or agree uh, with some of the points that you've heard. Anybody want to go first? I guess I could, I'd like to challenge a little bit the idea that patients and profits can't be fun. And I think you can look at drugs, the, the whole spectrum of drugs, there's something people are willing to pay out of pocket for and are very happy to pay out of pocket for, like Viagra, that people are getting what they want out of that experience. And you see it with LASIK surgery, you see it with other things. To me, you asked the question about would I be willing to pay $1,500 a year for Lyrica? I do. I pay an insurance premium and 
No one's giving away the lyrics that you make. Um, and I would particularly pay for it if I knew that lyrics was going to be more effective for me than another agent. So the fact that we're learning more about personalizing medicines. But, you know, as Tom said earlier, personalizing medicines is going to make them more expensive, not less expensive. Because once I know that I have cancer and this drug is going to work for me well, my willingness to pay for that drug is, is, is up a lot. And to me, that's fantastic. If that drug um, would extend my life by, by a certain amount of time and I'd know it. So I guess it's challenging the idea that you can't use profit incentives to, um, to work in the interest of the patients. And then to the point about data, there is a lot of data available right now. Insurance companies have it. They can connect the medical record to the prescription. And you know this, this flood of new data that's coming, the only data that is really going to be collected is data that people need to get paid on. You don't collect data on side effects necessarily. You don't collect data on a lot of these other intangibles. So what is it that is going to be so transformational, I guess, about the new data versus what we have now? And why are people not exploiting the data that we have now to do some of the stuff that, that you're talking about? Well, I, um, I mean, I think you're right that the insurance companies have a lot of data. Um, it's, it's not particularly appropriate data for a lot of problems. Um, I would say the insurance companies are much less healthcare companies than you are. So they're much less interested in using that to advance human health. They're, they're interested in using it to minimize costs, but not human health. Um, I do not believe um, you have the kind of data that you really need. Uh, I think that, that, you know, if you asked, you know, let's take um, Lipitor. If you said, if I look at, you know, um, you, I don't know how many patients are on Lipitor. Let's say there's a million patients on Lipitor in the United States. I might be exaggerating. How many? 13, 13 million patients on Lipitor. Okay, 13 million patients. Um, I, I think that, that you probably don't know much about them, what their weight is, their outcomes, their goals. Um, and, I, and I think that uh, that is a failed opportunity. Um, and it's also um, a reason that patients distrust you because I think that, that drilling on that question, being able to answer the question, does it work for this group, this group, this group, uh, and do it transparently and openly. I mean, you know, we talk about data. I mean, you know, I had to, I was looking up lyric side effects. I had a PhD spent a day and a half reading trials to get three numbers, you know. I said, this, that's not transparent data. So, um, and they couldn't get everything they wanted. So I think that all of these things are, um, are, are opportunities to get better. And that, that's why I think there really is a choice. If you believe you are that good, then you should open everything up and, and, and push it out there and let the world work on it.
many people will per capita there. That's how drugs come to the marketplace. And it doesn't matter if it comes out of Harold Barnes' lab or our own or somebody else who's, who's lesser. There are plenty of great ideas, but the real shortage is the money that we put at risk to, to have these massive, massive trials that we all want in these great areas of medical need. That's, that's, where, that's the difference. Does that mean it's a game changer, what he said, or not? Um, it's a game changer is like what somebody's able to sort through the, this, this, this absolute sea of data and, and, and make a difference. That's 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 what it's that's what it's going to be doing. Oh, yeah. Uh, he, he, he got it. You know, I, I think uh, everything you said is true. I think the, the, the challenge is, you know, we have massive economic incentives for the generation of new molecules that, that under some certain conditions modify health and there's great reward for that if it's done well. But there are some really simple questions that we don't know the answers to. So for, I was at Mayo a couple of weeks ago and you know, let's just step out of the drug company example for a second and say, what percentage of the hip replacements did you know how well the people could walk before you did it and do you know whether the people are even alive five years later? And the answer is way below 1% and zero quantitative assessment. And, you know, and, and I, I'm not arguing, hip replacements are your competitors. They're taking your money. They're taking the, 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 budget out of the, the money out of the budget. They're, they're purporting to generate value. Um, and, and, uh, and, and in that environment, um, I mean, you know, if I, I mean, I'm a manufacturing engineer. I'm a simple mechanical engineer. I got into drug discovery because my brother got sick, yada, yada, yada. But we wouldn't make a plastic toy with that level of quality control. That would be so unacceptable. <laughs> so I, it's more to my mind, it's not that, that this is an either or, this is an and. This is imagine if we could. And you know, when you're talking about compounds that have you know, $10,000 a year, or you know, in the case of Jelenia that was just launched last week, $50,000, $48,000 a year costs, you know, the idea of spending a couple hundred on managing an individual data point is just seems reasonable. Um, it's far less than Toyota would spend on something as unimportant as a Tercel. Do you want to comment on this? Okay. And then I'm going to come to you. You know, one, one of my um, um, fundamental challenges with healthcare is how easily we equate human life with cars and um, um, computers and uh, we, we treat human beings as if they're fungible. Um, that because someone got a hip replacement and they died two weeks later, they shouldn't have gotten the hip replacement. I'm fundamentally opposed to that way of thinking. And I think, you know, that's the challenge of the 21st century. We, we've gotten ourselves into a place where we think that we can rationalize human health to the point where it's just another business investment. It's like, like we're fixing a machine here and it ought to have an ROI of five years or 10 years or two weeks, or we should decide that um, a, a, a productive year is worth $100,000. That's fundamentally the problem. That is absolutely fundamentally the problem. We have to treat human life with a lot more respect, with a lot more value, that getting into this game of, of trying to find economic value in interventions you know, is a dead end, because at the end of the day, if you let them die, it's cheaper. Fundamentally, if you let them die, there, there is no equation that you can produce that will demonstrate to you that if you let people die, you won't save money. And, and that is the fundamental challenge that I would put out there, that we need to have that conversation first. What's the value of a human life? That is because if, now that we have government involved in healthcare before in the 19th century, he went to the doctor and gave him a chicken. But now because technology is so expensive, we have to have government in the middle of this conversation. So we've democratized healthcare. And so I think part of that democracy question should be, so what's the value of human life? And so I mean, that's where I come from. I think it's fundamentally valuable. I think we need to fight for it every second of the day. 
As a patient advocate, I, I, I find it in, incomprehensible that any patient advocate would put costs, and I see them do it all the time, above health care. I don't think that's their job. Um, so I, anyway, that's what I think the conversation ought to be about. But Pfizer has to make a profit. That, the question is not to make uh, whether Pfizer makes a profit or not. The fundamental question is, at what point do we say that human life lost its value, and that there are, there are economic incentives out there that are more important than the lives that we look at. I mean, you know, I, I, I think it's an important question. It's, it's worthy of debate, minimum, worthy of debate. And maybe everybody disagrees and says, yeah, you know, what the heck. Um, I, I know people who have pets, and I have a pet, you go to the vet, and the vet says, your dog's going to die if you got to pay $10,000 for him. And I say, ah, you know, the dog's going to die. Right? I mean, I'm going to be a big cat. I do it. I think the dog's dead, right? But if the doctor came and said, well, your, your grandfather's going to die, you got to pay 10000 for it. Uh, no, i got to think about that, right? I won't say, yeah, you got to die. But i got to think about it, right? And so I think that's the kind of conversation you got to have. But it's different if, if your grandfather has two days to live or five, five years to live. You, I you, mean, personally, but, personally, I can't, I can't know that. I can't know that he's got two days. Gotta fight. You gotta, you gotta fight. Yeah, that's right. right. No, we have decided that healthcare resources are limited. That's not reality. There's no fun, There's no. There's nothing out there that says that healthcare resources are limited. We decide that. We decide 16% of the GDP or 10% or 5% or 3%. That's our decision. But that's okay. But it's it's a it's a it's a democratic decision that you have to acknowledge and vote on and say that's okay. Right now, Medicare says, because my father um, uh, looks like he has prostate cancer, he's 88 years old, and they say, well, we don't believe it. That's right. That's what the system says. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's okay, but maybe it's not okay. I don't know the answer to that. But what, I, what, I, what I'm objecting to is how easily we've slipped into this conversation in which we say human life has a finite market value to it. And I don't know that. I don't know what that is. And if everybody knows what it is, please help me. Just tell me it's $10, it's $5, it's $100, it's $20. No, but it is, it, is the, it is the next conversation at dinner tonight at whose ever table. He's lucky, <laughs> you're, you're lucky enough to sit at his table. That's great. Thank you. Please. Okay. So in thinking about the three speakers, I thought about sort of where the impact of new information might be. It's sort of not so black and white, it's a little bit more gray in my opinion. I think I agree with Kirsten a little bit. So the impact of new information in healthcare, healthcare as opposed to a lot of other industries have regulated quality information. What other industry has the government to approve that you're a better quality product <laughs> than something else based on randomized evidence. No other industry has that. So it's very high level of, of uh, for technologies, medical products at least, uh, level of information in order for you just to market the product. No other, no other industry has that. So I think that's one area, procedures versus technology or medical products. I think it's a huge difference for because procedures, one, are not owned by anyone. There's no IP. And therefore, there's no incentive to market the, in terms of getting the information out right correctly, either by this marketing competitors or marketing your own drug. <clears throat> and second, you don't have the mandated randomized information that you have to provide before you go on the market. That's a big difference, both for CER in terms of public money being focused on procedures rather than medical products. It should be. So. The impact, I think, of new quality information uh, is hard to <clears throat> think of that it's going to have dramatic impact uh, compared to many other industries because there's so much quote unquote transparency already through the FDA approval process. The second aspect is that for things that really work, we really don't need a lot of sort of uh, randomized trials and, and that of that nature. We don't need to, I mean, there's no one the industry relies on that and, and things get through to, what really works gets through. I mean, the 
<coughs> take the example I talked about today, the HIV therapies of, of heart in, in 96. We, would, we, we didn't really need a trial to figure out that people were living a lot longer. It was pretty obvious. So the question is, for the stuff that really works, I don't think it's going to be a big difference of having so much more information because that really goes through easily. Uh, <clears throat> and people know when things really work. The, the stuff where it matters is the marginal stuff, <clears throat> excuse me, such as, you know, uh, where we don't really know whether it works or not. But then it doesn't really matter, again, whether we're using or not so much because it's marginal by definition. So the impact of, of all this information in a market where 70% of spending is on chronic disease, i.e. patients who learn over time a lot about what the treatments available are and how well they're working. A market where the government mandates that you provide randomized information on how, how well things are working. And third, we have mandates on informed intermediaries letting you on therapy, i.e. doctors, before you actually get to consume it. It's hard to see exactly why that industry will respond more to this available of, uh, uh, you know, IT-based information than other industries. Thanks. Uh, two thoughts. One, with respect to your point that you made on um, personalized medicine, as we get closer to targeted therapies, they're certainly going to cost more money. They should be reimbursed at a higher level. Here's your challenge. You don't have the credibility to go into a system and say, pay us more for this because it works better. You need to be working with your alliances, the other folks in the community, like the patient organizations, the provider community, to make that case because we're the only ones that can stand up and say, when the treatment works for me, and I know it's going to work, I should be paying more for that. You've got an opportunity there because if you don't see that opportunity, you're going to be forced into a place where we're going to demand more targeted therapies, which are simply going to be paid the same way you are for population-based therapy. So I think you have to start looking at this differently. We're going to have that discussion in this country in the next two years. If you're at the table trying to hold that end of it all by yourself, it's not going to fly. Second issue on information, I think we've been blending a lot of different ideas with information, but here, here's one point I'd like to make. Uh, we live in this era of transparency. I think we're about to move out of the era of transparency. Um, these sort of errors last for about 10 to 12 years, and we're coming to the end of this one. I'm not sure what the next one is going to be, but there's a great author, Covey, who defines effective communication as the balance between courage and compassion. The courage to be honest and forthright with the information. Tell what's good, tell what's bad. But the compassion to understand its impact on the listener. The reality is when you do what the FDA and your lawyers tell you to do and you put all that harm out there, it confuses the patient community into thinking that the magnitude and likelihood of harm are grossly exaggerated. They don't take the medications. They suffer the consequences of their chronic diseases. That's not appropriate. That's not compassionate. It may have been courageous, but you know what? It was not compassionate. We have an opportunity now to move out of this year into something different. Jim, I'm going to come to you. I just please go ahead. Go back. Okay. You want to talk while I'm getting there? I, I just want to bring up uh, Jim's point earlier today about taboo. 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 Nobody can attack four three jobs tell you what the guidelines really are. Nobody can force a single or an Amazon to be competitive and they get sold. So as a business, we have the right to be non transparent the way those businesses are. The problem is because our business is completely perfect, it is taboo. Craig set my question up beautifully, thanks. So, um, uh, you know, what struck me as I was listening here is um, 
we talk, we've been talking about some big ideas for Pfizer or big ideas for the pharma industry, which are very important to look at. But everyone in this room knows we're one of the most highly regulated industries in the world, apart from nuclear energy and, and others. Um, governments are also not known for their innovative, progressive ideas like Google. So um, I, I wonder really what the, what the answer is in, in terms of trying to get some of these together. Um, we're a global company. There's very little that we can do in the US without having to transfer some of those ideas and thoughts to other countries. There's very little sometimes in certain states of the US we can't do without making it US wide. So I, I would just sort of wonder at some point over the next couple of days whether there's a, another big set of questions or big new ideas that would be more for a Davos G10 forum around patient-centric healthcare as opposed to a Pfizer forum around patient-centric healthcare because this company in this country is not going to be able to address some of the big challenges that we have in terms of, of revolutionizing how we deliver innovation, how we create innovation and how we address the question of, so what is the value of a human life? Uh, and it just struck me that we, we're sitting here talking for talking about big ideas and big solutions. There's another set of big ideas we need to consider. Sam? Yeah, speak up. Can you speak up? Anybody who can get to the mic, please feel free to get in the queue if you like, because I can't get to you quick enough maybe. Thank you. Um, I would just like to, as an outside observer here, very much associate myself with what Gary said. Uh, what's the magic number about 17? Uh, uh, you know, IT is about 17% of GDP as well, and every time that goes up, people cheer. Uh, 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 people think it's great. Uh, there's two, at least two Nobel Prize winning economists that I know of, Robert Fogel and uh, Ken Arrow, have said, look, healthcare is, is what economists call a superior good. It, it, expenditures for health care rise about 60% faster than people's income. After you get through your Maslowian lower needs, you move up and you think about things you want more of. And I think that's what makes me optimistic about this industry, uh, is that people want to live. Uh, uh, um, and I, I think that what's so striking to me, uh, as somebody who lives in Washington, uh, is how the political culture, both parties, is completely at war with what I'll call, for lack of a better word, the life instinct that people have. The, all the policy discussion in both parties is limits, limits, cuts, cuts, restrain, 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 whether it's using the bureaucrats on one side or the free market on the other, the bottom line is the same. Uh, US News last year uh, had a, 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 a joint interview next to each other. It was uh, 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 Peter Singer and uh, Michael Tainer, uh, Princeton University and the Cato Institute, and they both answered this question the same way. Should we ration health care? Absolutely. Uh, Singer wanted to do it with the, with, with the government, and uh, Tanner wanted to do it with, with the, the free market. I mean, and the proof of where real people live on this issue is popular culture. ER, house, uh, every, every advertisement. Uh, 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 it was it terribly striking to me just a, couple day, just a week or two ago that when that study from Sweden came out about breast cancer that said that, yes, you should get a mammogram at 40, uh, that the government was completely wrong. The, Preventive Services Task Force uh, a year before, it led the news. It led Diane Sawyer. I'm sure that from a policy point of view, the average producer and writer and you know the copy editor at, at ABC News completely agrees with Obama on you know mammograms should only be infrequent and less is more and appropriate technology and so on. And yet, driven I'm sure by eyeballs, they said, look, the, the story that's most likely to get ratings for us is if we lead with Dr. Richard Besser saying that the government's just dead wrong, get your mammogram, listen to, the ex listen to all the other experts who don't work for HHS, and they'll tell you to get mammograms every, every year at 40. And so uh, I think that m moral force somewhat uh, uh, trumps uh, the instinct for transparency. I agree, uh, Amazon's not transparent, Apple's not transparent, nobody cares, because they want what they make and they need to be reminded of what they make and, and, and why it's good. And I think that the analogy, you know, I, I admit I'm writing a book about this, I'm, I'm kind of loaded up on it, um, <laughs> is we're fighting a war. When you get sick with cancer, like your father, he didn't say, I'm consuming oncological services. He, he said, I'm fighting cancer, I'm here to win this. And maybe you win, maybe you lose, but you're, it's a war. And when you fight a war, 
you know, nobody, again, nobody, no war that you win is fought with transparency about, well, here's how the Manhattan Project is coming along today, and here's when we're invading Normandy Beach tomorrow, and so on. Um, there's a larger issue here, and again, if you want to mobilize the patient community, you say, look, we're, stick with us, and we're going to cure Alzheimer's in 10 years, or we're going to cure whatever in 10 years. That's, that's a winning formula, and you'll be, you'll be amazed not only how many allies you get, again, and, and, and once you, you get off the issue of, you know, Greg is exactly right when he talked about those bullseyes, you know, to, to the average American, ROI is no more of a better moral authority than saving the government money, maybe even worse. Uh, uh, you know, the patient, what's in it for you? That's the pitch, and if you do that, you know, you can, you, the transparency can be one way. You can get information from the insurance companies, you can get information from the government and so on, but then you say, listen, of course we're keeping a secret because we're trying to make this work. Uh, I, I, I should add a few things. I mean, like, I go back and forth on this quite a lot because I, I covered healthcare, and, you know, it, it is interesting to me how many of the people who were really pushing for healthcare, they do see it. I had a weird conversation with a guy who writes about it for the Post, where I, I said something about, um, you know, cost cutting, uh, and he was like, "Well, of course we favor cost cutting." And I'd been talking about cost cutting in the private sector, and he just interprets, he sees it as like a big pot of money, and and that his mandate is to cut how much we spend on that big pot of money. And I've said, I think that that is a crazy way to look at it. I think that if if healthcare, I think healthcare services are a superior good. Um, and if you look at what reinsurers, the, the people who reinsure healthcare insurance, like where they say their biggest cost is growing, it's basically four areas. Cardiovascular, I mean, you guys probably know a lot of this because you sell a lot of this. Cardiovascular, cancer, um, neonatal, and uh, a couple of, uh, and, and some chronic stuff that's um, fairly rare. So these are their four big cost areas. Well, where are we going to cut those? And so when people talk about cost control, I'd be like, we're not going to control costs because are you going to go... Uh, are you going to go and say, you know what, you're 35, you kind of shouldn't have a baby because it might be premature, and that's going to cost a lot of money, so why don't you just not do that? Um, or your baby came 25, at 25 weeks, and yeah, it's going to have problems. You don't want to do We're just pulling the plug. We're not going to say it. We're not going to say it about, well, grandma has cancer, and, you know, we're only really going to get five weeks out of this drug, and it costs $30,000. We're going to talk a lot about saying it, but if you look actually what transparency does to cost, if you look at places, what's interesting to me is watching how this is to, how um, we are undermining the English-speaking healthcare systems. Um, so, like you guys are probably familiar with the case of New Zealand, what's happened with Herceptin in, in New Zealand and Great Britain, which is that they put it's very expensive, um, so they put rigid controls on it. They had protocols. The, New Zealand denied it for early stage, only for, they only had it for late stage, um, and those totally broke down. They, were, they worked as long as people didn't know what was happening in America. But when women went on the internet and found out that if you have breast cancer in America, you can get Herceptin, any stage you want, you know, et cetera, they went ballistic, and they fought it, and they took it to the news, and the government caved. They absolutely, so these cost control, as long as there is information, our cost is going to keep expanding. I think that that's mostly okay. I mean, at some point, healthcare is just not going to consume 100% of GDP, right? We are not going to stop eating so that we can pay for our cancer drugs. Um, but the, when you look at the regulatory structure, it's not well positioned to handle that at all. And I think one thing to think about, because I, I hear a lot of complaints in this room, about how the regular, and I am second to none in my many criticisms of the FDA. Um, but something to think about is the, one of the most fundamental human fears is that of being poisoned. And we fear it differently from the way we fear, like if, if you look at how people's brains react, they react to it differently than they react to other physical threats. So if I threaten to club you, you will actually like have different parts of your brain activated than if I threaten to poison you. And there are sort of good evolutionary reasons for this. But what that boils down to is when we ran through the list of all the industries that are regulated, right? Energy, nuclear, pharma. What does it all have in common? I can't see it. There's some insidious threat in the environment and I can't tell it's there. I could be, be, I could be being killed right now by an electrical power line outside and I don't know. And that's way more terrifying than knowing that there's some mugger 
who is coming down the street to, to hit me. And so that's not going to change. The, I, the trend of regulation on pharma is going to go to tighter, not to looser. Not on cost control, but on all the other stuff. We're going to get, they're going to make it worse because that is simply the sort of natural imperative. And thinking about how the natural imperative, like with personalized medicine, what's the natural imperative of a bureaucracy? It's not to have personalized anything. And so when you look at Obamacare, yes, the technology is there. All of the, all of the stuff is unfolding. When you look at the fact that the government's going to come in and do comparative effectiveness, et cetera, like they can't handle 50,000 different, they, they want one. That's why they all complain about Me Too drugs. That's why they, they want one drug. They want one drug for blood pressure, one drug for cardiovascular, one, et cetera. And that, is the, and that is a really, really powerful bureaucratic imperative. It's interesting. I don't know. I, th I think I somehow got us in this cost thing, and it's just not something I actually care about. Um, in fact, I'll throw out a number. I, threw, I spent $50 million trying to save my brother. $50 million. And I don't know that, that was too much or too little, but that's what I spent. Um, I actually think, I, I want to argue with you, and I want to actually go with what Kirsten said a minute or earlier, which is that, that I don't actually believe we have a functioning information marketplace right now. I, I think that it isn't about whether or not um, a, 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 a knee replacement or an improved arthritis drug is a choice. I just don't think we've got any honest clearing mechanisms for these tools. And, and I say that as someone that does research all the time onto what drug that an individual should take. And, um, and I, you know, to my mind, this is a great opportunity. I mean, if you talk about the pressures, I agree. The government, we, you know, my friends at HHS, and they're all friends of mine, goal is to be England. You know, I'm English. That's not a, you know, if I were poor and not one of the people in this room, maybe that's a better goal than we have now, but that's not my goal. I want the innovation system that's driving all of these advances in healthcare. I want the system that's supporting, you know, the cures for the disease I care about. And I think that we don't have an information market that works yet that shows the value that's generated. I think that is the responsibility and the opportunity. I think if, and I think pharma would win if we build this information market. I mean, that's the point about that. And it's not, yes, there's, a, there's mountains of data that are unconnected and, you know, unindexed and uncategorized and unusable and unquality checked and unaudited and, and un, un, unvaluable, worthless. And if we begin to build structured markets that serve individual patients' needs on choosing what to do, then pharma's going to win. Patients absolutely win. Ironically, we might just save money because people get better, and value will be generated because people live longer, healthier, more productive lives with greater well-being. That's the opportunity that I think we're describing. But it's not about the data. It's about using it, building that functional market. Just, just a comment added to that. I, I, can under, I can agree with what you just said, but please... Let's remember that we cannot only see the world through the American eyes. There's a whole world, there's Asia, there's Europe, there's Latin America, and the needs, the views may be very different there. And I think we need to recognize that if we're going to talk about uh, working together for a healthier world, it's not only the U.S. Without knowing too much of the science, isn't the world becoming like the U.S. in many ways in terms of what people get sick from, like sedentary diseases and, you know, car I mean, in other words, so all the ethnic differences, which are extremely worth studying, uh, something tells me that if we had a, if somebody were to develop a drug for Alzheimer's in this country, uh, you could sell it to the rest of the world pretty easily. And the Chinese and the Indians and who, the, the Europeans, uh, mm -hmm. suitably modified for ethnicity, I uh, would be delighted to buy it because I think uh, Megan's point about New Zealand and the UK is exactly right. If people will die contentedly if, if they don't think there's an alternative, but if they do know there's an alternative, they'll demand it and they'll roll their own governments uh, to get it. And I think that'll be true in China and India as well. But yes, people get sick the same way, but I mean, the, the environment looks different. I need not go further than to my country, my neighbor countries, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. I mean, we're not even talking about whether patients are willing to pay or not. 
They simply don't have the money. And I mean, we're facing that kind of problem as well. And I mean, the, that's why I say that we may be going the way that the US is today, but there are many regions of the world which are 20, 30, 40 years behind. And we still have to deal with that. Uh, uh, several people in the room have spent small lifetimes working on that last problem in terms of access uh, uh, to medicine in parts of the world that don't have money or to have wildly differing economic strata within the country. Another p particularly unique thing about healthcare. There are a couple of ideas that came out though that I wanted to be sure that uh, that we that we paid attention to. One of the things that um, uh, Jamie said about you know the information war, and which I think is the focus of what what we'll be doing in the patient-centered outcome research work uh, that Fried is on the board of now. This piece in the healthcare bill is the difference between what helps and what harms is the difference that that's measured by tens and hundreds of billions of dollars. And the first people to figure that out and act on it will have a huge benefit to them. Um, and how we get the data to do that, uh, instead of data just about the drug, we have to get data about the problem, which is something else Jamie had said about you have to target solving the problem that the drug is addressing. So you can have a drug that has an endpoint, and you hit the endpoint, and it turns out that you still haven't solved the problem because your endpoint was wrong. You actually, you hit it, but so what? Uh, it's like shrinking a tumor but not being able to deal with metastasis. Um, so there's a, there's a large space of opportunity if we shift our assumption from a drug that hits a target to a drug and other things, diet, exercise, et cetera, that address the problem. Um, uh, I think data monopoly has always been um, uh, an assumption of the of the 20th century, and now the problem, of course, is that anybody can have data, uh, but not a lot of information. So you have a lot of people generating a lot of data, and nobody's turning it into valuable information. We're the only group that is regulated in how we talk about our data. Our critics are totally unregulated in how they talk about our data. So we have to find better ways to talk about our data and then convince the government that we have the right to do that. And we have another marching army of people working on communication and the freedom to communicate with exactly that assumption that we can talk better about our data and more, be more meaningful to patients, but we have to show it's valuable to the government in order to do that. Um, and then the, the, uh, uh, the last point is know the difference you make. I think that is an incredible challenge that is exactly the kind of thing that we have a huge opportunity to do. If we can follow people, not just IMS data and, and, and doctors' prescriptions, if we can actually follow people and really start understanding the difference we make, then we can show that value to people uh, in the aggregate as well as in anecdotal evidence. And that is something that we've really never been able to do that new information tools enable us to do. And I, and I think that is a huge challenge to show the difference you make. But what's the alternative? Uh, the alternative is just to convince people that because we make money selling a drug that they're better off with it. And yes, we should make a lot of money selling a drug that works, but we need to be able to, to show that we know it works because we're following the unexpected success and the unexpected good events of drugs, not just the adverse events. We're required to, re to know about adverse events. Nobody seems to care when there are unexpected good events. That is devalued in the system. So we have to raise, we have to raise that up somehow. Last point, then I'll shut up. Direct-to-consumer advertising. Uh, the change just within Pfizer and the way we do DTC in the last year has been amazing. The Lipitor ads that talk about diet and behavior instead of the Jarvik ads, getting rid of the Viva Viagra and making them more uh, truly meaningful discussions about uh, quality of life, uh, that, has a, that makes a difference to people. 
And uh, the, the mantra that if only we would stop advertising, we could save all that money and lower prices is exactly the kind of thing we need to be transparent about. It would raise our prices because DTC brings in revenue. It doesn't cost money. It makes money. It should make money, but it should make money for the right reasons. And if you advertise in the right way, people respect you. And then if doctors respond to their questions in the right way, then it's good for health care. If they don't, it's bad for health care. And that's the one part that we don't have the control over is that interaction between the doctor and the informed patient. And that, that's a challenge that is sometimes beyond our borders. Uh, I guess this is a comment, not a question. And uh, I'm sort of getting confused about what are the fundamental issues and what are the marginal issues. And one fundamental issue that nobody's addressed, I think, is the productivity problems in the industry. And the reason I mention this is information, arguing about whether we have an information revolution or an information war, all that stuff is secondary. I mean, as Tom said, you know, if, if the drugs that work, work. And if we invent stuff that works, people will pay for it. And as Megan said, you know, all you need is to just show people that something works and they'll go fight and get it. And we will be able to price it. And if we can come up with personalized medicines that cure certain diseases and we want to charge $60,000 a year, we'll be able to charge that if, if, if they really deliver the value. And I, I don't agree that you know some countries can't pay for this. A lot of countries can pay for a lot of wars, and they can uh, arm their militias and all that kind of stuff. They can they can pay for medicines too. So I don't think cost issues and and willingness to pay issues are the key. So to me, a fundamental issue, which is why we're arguing about the secondary stuff, the fundamental issue is that we're not producing a lot of medicines. Um, when we were producing a lot of medicines, nobody had any problems. And you look at this industry 20 years ago when we had a revolution, say, in cardiovascular medicines, we were fine. I mean, people were willing to pay. And the, the percentage paid uh, out of the healthcare dollar going to drugs went up in the 90s. And nobody complained. Uh, so I, I think that's a fundamental problem. And the second, the second question in my mind is the link between what kind of system exists and the... It, providing the right incentives to, to, to innovate. Can we make the case that if we get reimbursed in the way we want to be reimbursed, we're going to be able to produce the medicines that people want? And I think we haven't made that case, and our own 10-year history argues against that. But if we can argue for that, if we can say, you know, just give us a chance, and within 10 years we'll deliver important cures for cancer. We're never going to deliver a cure for cancer. There is no such thing or we're going to deliver important cures for Alzheimer's, then I think, so, I think our problems are solved. Those are the fundamental issues. What It's productivity and producing stuff that actually works and making the case that you need a certain reimbursement system that supports the right incentives to get us to do these things. Um, and I don't know what the solution to that is besides getting uh, better productivity from our labs or from our business development. But all the stuff about information and willingness to pay and bending the cost curve, you know, uh, as people said, people are happy to spend money on IT, and they they cheer when when the percentages go up. We we want to be in that other, in, we want to be like IT. We want people to cheer when they when the share of spending on healthcare goes up. But that's never going to happen unless they pe people are getting something for the money that they spend. So. Oh boy. <laughs> Just to follow on Tamara's point, I think actually Mark brought up the one idea that is good for patients, good for productivity, and good for the industry, which is protect data exclusivity, not patents. I mean, that uh, short of changing the way our lab, and, and people like Eric and Joe know more about that, that kind of productivity, but being able to put some of these molecules back out to be retested, because that's what we do well as a drug company. We are good at doing clinical trials. We reap a lot of profit from successful innovations, and then we have you know, the capital to spend on other things, or at least we are seen as a good, you know, a good investment for people to lend us some money. And that's, that's fundamentally different. That, to me, is the biggest idea that, that we've, we've had today. And to Tamara's point, the rest of them are sort of chipping around the edges. And they'll help, but, but that's fundamentally different. I, I just want to respond, because this concept of dormant therapies really does get to the heart of your issue on productivity. We've identified tens of thousands of small molecules that have been into the clinical 
uh, trial process that have been shelved because the patents were running out, patents had, had expired, or simply didn't meet the technical requirements for patents. We have certain kinds of cancer cures. We have the best known treatment from Parkinson, no patent. We have patient advocacy organizations that have spent over $200 million to hire companies to develop and commercialize these products. There's a huge wealth of products out there not coming to market that would treat people with chronic disease and disabilities as a result of this issue. That's a solvable problem. And that gets to the productivity. Those things should not be shelved. And it does not create a dynamic shift in your business funnel. Well, um, all, what all one needs to do is come up with a couple of hundred million dollars <laughs> or, or a couple of hundred, you know, a couple billion dollars and stop it. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Yep. So, you know, we, no one is more frustrated with the shelves monster. So I'm going to say that that's what the head of office is trying to say. The team, the, the monster that they're creating, no one is more frustrated than the people who are working on it. It doesn't matter if they're small company or large company or have a team. So we're in full agreement. All we need to do, all we need to do is have a, a general team that backs off. Right. 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 Here is that we're going to give you that sort of data specific. Right. So yeah, I, I completely well, agree. It's, I, it's I, I'm an advocate. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm very familiar yeah. with what you're trying yeah. to do. Yeah. But that is that's a that is running completely counter to what Dr. Swanson is is advocating. No matter how you slice it, that's running. That is being heavily manipulated. Uh. uh not based on the, the more than 40 conversations with um, leadership of head. So I, 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 I'll tell you, it, it, it's critical. It, it's not just critical to your business model. It's critical to the patient community. This is something that the patient community is making one of its top three priorities. They're planning on flying in people in wheelchairs to make this case. Um, so, so I agree with you. It, it's a challenge. And the reality is nobody's going to put this money up. It's not a sustainable business model for the patient advocacy community. We don't have hundreds of millions of dollars, and you're certainly not going to invest uh, billions of dollars into products that you can't recoup uh, an investment in. This changes it, and these are therapies that are never going to come to the market. This is a game changer, and I think this is going to be something you need to be looking at because it's going to change your business model along with this concept of targeting therapies and, and attaching data exclusivity in that space. We, so we are, we're well, almost at the end. Well, I was going to say... I'm, I'm going to let you talk. Let me just think what we're going to do, because we're almost out of time. I'm going to take these two questions, because you had your hands up. I'm going to let you answer, and then I've got a final question for Greg. So, so I, I actually, ev I think everyone would completely agree that it would be nice to build a functional market where the, the, the information value that generated that improved human health, both in restricting the therapies to those that are most effective and introducing new therapies to those that don't have it, should be rewarded. But going back to the challenge of the day, which I think Greg articulated pretty well, I mean, that, there is a second goal here. The challenge of the day was assume the patent laws are the same and then try and make the business successful. Because as much as I you know, wrote, wrote my check and signed up and said, hey, you know, let's go and change the world and healthcare is going to be better and you know, I'm sure this bill is going to do it all, I think we're stuck with what we got. And the question is, what can a business do today given that the laws are not changing tomorrow. They may change the day after. This, this gentleman here, he had a, did you still have a question? Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> not so much questions, but uh, a comments may generate questions. Uh, a couple of things. I, when I first joined Pfizer in the early 90s, I came as a, a research scientist. And uh, the point that was made to us at the very beginning was that in R&D, we do not make drugs. We don't produce drugs. We produce information. We produce data. That data is then tested in a clinic, uh, in animal models, and so forth. So we deal in information and discovery. That, that's our primary uh, our currency, if you will. Now, I also worked in um, drug repurposing, and where we looked at new indications for, for different molecules. And I guarantee you that if there was an, uh, uh, a Parkinson's cure out there, we'd find a way to patent it. 
I mean, they, they, we would find a way around it because um, it just yeah, the, uh, the the just the profit margin right there, or the 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 um, the nerdy that would go with with that molecule. So I have a hard time believing that there are these cures that that we're not touching because we can't patent them. I mean, there are ways around that. I, I I've been in the in the field long enough to know that. Now, something something that really occurred to me is. Um, with respect to information and sharing information, we're not hiding anything. Well, we publish freely. Um, as soon as the molecule is patented, that's, that's available for people to look at and generate ideas from. Um, another thing that occurs to me is the fact that all these pre-competitive consortia that have turned up, most recently one that made a lot of news was um, the uh, Foundation for NIH sponsors, uh, uh, sponsors uh, 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 biomarker consortia, safety biomarker consortia, where um, there was a, a rather famous or large breakthrough with respect to Alzheimer's biomarkers. Um, that made a lot of news, and it was, it was a great example of the way industries and academia can collaborate pre-competitively and share their information. However, we still don't have a cure for Alzheimer's. We're not anywhere near closer to having a cure for Alzheimer's. Um, you need to be careful what type of information you're talking about. You're talking about biomarker information or you're talking about a molecule that results in disease reversal or disease uh, modification. The, the, the questions or the problems here are, are, are extremely complex. But I, I think the most important thing we can do is, is to continue to talk and to share the information. But, but uh, Unless I misunderstood, I don't, I don't believe that we're hiding any information, nor do I believe that there are cures that are not, that are not being, being followed up on if there was any significant data to suggest that, that they do offer some therapy. So. Great, so we've had some really good conversation about the um, prescription medication market, and in fact, I think we've had such great conversation, we're about out of time. So. I'll invite maybe cocktail and dinner conversation um, around the question I'm about to ask. Um, and that is that Pfizer also has a very robust consumer health care business. And we have the top selling product, for example, Advil. And I'm curious if there are lessons learned or thoughts on game changing um, ideas in this space. And how can we maybe leverage the very different relationship that we have with um, patients to create new patient centric um, models. Um, in the uh, OTC side, and I should note on that the information exchange question um, becomes very different when you look at it from um, the self-medication market. And by the way, uh, Advil is not covered by any patents. So interesting discussion and debate from that perspective as well. Thank you. Well, I hope our panel has delivered on its uh, promise of nine uh, challenges and uh, provocative uh, uh, solutions, if you will. There, of the nine, there are three in particular I want to highlight as we go into uh, our cocktail hour and our dinner hour. One is the whole notion of the dr drastic changing demographics in the U.S. Um, and the impact, potential impact of that financially for Pfizer and other pharmaceutical companies going further. I thought, thought Gary made an excellent point about that. Uh, the other is the point about Pfizer becoming or moving from or transitioning from a drug dealer, if you will, to a healthcare company. I thought that was a very intriguing idea. And can you do that profitably? And third, um, the uh, ethical and technological questions associated with real-time tracking, uh, and this is a global question, not just domestic for Pfizer, but real-time tracking of the impact on patients who are on a particular drug. How feasible is that? How financially uh, viable is that? Can you make a profit doing it? And there are ethical and technological questions associated with that. My final uh, question, if you will, is for Greg. Imagine you were tapped tomorrow to lead a major pharmaceutical company. <laughs> what would be your first three policy initiatives?
Um, uh, I think the first thing I would do is remove all the labels from all the people in research about what they're focused on and, and realign people as w working teams rather than as people who think they're focused on a particular area. And if they succeed in that area, they've had a good day. So I think the first thing you do is you knock down all the titles and you knock down all the walls in the research part and get people talking to people and keep them mixed up. That'd be number one. And by the way, we should do that at NIH, too. Good, um, good luck. <laughs> uh, secondly, um, uh, I think that um, I would, have, uh, I would have a very conscious decision about what kind of shareholder you want. Because if you're always having to be responsible to your shareholders, you want to make sure that the shareholders you have respect the business model you want to have. So, um, for instance, our CFO talks a lot about the fact that our investor demographic, so to speak, is changing with the drop-off of Lipitor and Pfizer being a company that's not trying to win every time but win over time. That changes your shareholder mix. So I think a really conscious uh, decision about who you want to reach out to as investors and what kind of face you want to have to the world and being more patient-centered as a business model uh, gives you that opportunity. Uh, and then the last thing is uh, really the first thing, which is human capital. Um, the, there, there just is no machine or science you can bring into the company that's going to be more valuable than the best human capital you can find. So that means that you have to be able to grow people, you have to be able to bring people in from other disciplines, and one of the, as, as was mentioned earlier today, the biggest breakthroughs and the biggest innovations always come from outside the field. So I think it's important to constantly have a influx of people who are not drinking the Kool-Aid, and have, they may be drinking other Kool-Aid, they may think physics are the end-all, be-all, not biology, but you bring a computer scientist in, you bring an electrical engineer in and ask them about cancer, you get a very different uh, answer. So those three things, um, knock down the walls, really decide what kind of shareholders you want, and make sure you're bringing in new people who don't live here all the time, um, I think would be the first three things I'd do, and I can't believe you asked me that. <laughs> Give yourself in the panel a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, this is an opportunity. Uh, we have 30 minutes before cocktail hour, which gives you the opportunity of actually going outside and walking around the grounds or going back to Greg's room because apparently it's so large he has a living room and he's giving tours. My living room is just a piece of it. Everybody <laughs> come to 43, I'll give you a tour. <laughs> okay, at 6 o'clock, the cocktail hour will begin at the Miles Room and Terrace. It's on the terrace that, that is a, just a gorgeous area. It's located next to the restaurant, so when you go into the restaurant, go to the left, that's the Miles Room, and then pick up a drink. And those who are presenting for Pfizer tomorrow, this is an opportunity for you to actually go through your PowerPoint um, with the technician tonight. Right now. Thank you. See you soon. Perfect.